yesterday as I was finishing editing the vlog that went up this morning that I actually never came back on here and updated you on Fourth Wing once I finished it. I thought that I did, but apparently I only updated my Goodreads. So I wanted to go ahead and come on here and actually give you my overall thoughts on Fourth Wing, especially because I really don't have any other reading updates. I did finish Mercury yesterday as expected and I really enjoyed it. I think I'm going to settle on a four stars. I thought it was a very well-written family drama, complicated, flawed characters, and very complex family dynamics. And I just found myself enjoying the journey of following the characters as they learn and grew and became better versions of themselves. I was pleasantly surprised by the experience. It definitely seemed something that was going to be up my alley when I read the synopsis, but you never know how that's going to go, right? And so I'm just very glad that I had such a positive reading experience with that. I am settling on a strong four stars. It definitely had the possibility of being higher, but I feel like the ending was a little bit anticlimactic for everything that we watched these characters go through. I would have liked a little bit more oomph from the ending, if that makes sense. It definitely didn't get a lot of emotion out of me at the end, and that's kind of what I was looking for. So I'm going to settle on a four stars, but that's not bad at all. I very much enjoyed it, and I will absolutely be reading more from Amy Jo Burns in the future, should she write more, and I highly recommend, especially if you are a character-driven reader. And then I actually do not plan on starting another audiobook right away because I want to try to catch up again on my booktube queue, which has blown up again. I haven't really watched anything for the past, I want to say like a week and a half. My queue went from zero at the new year, and now it's like 55 plus, and I really want to try to get that down. So today and tomorrow, which is Martin Luther King Jr. Day, I have off work, and so I'm really going to be focusing on my booktube queue instead of listening to an audiobook. And I'm going to be spending most of the day today and tomorrow working on editing and schoolwork. That's basically all I'm going to be doing. So anyway, quickly, I just wanted to wrap up my feelings on Fourth Wing. From start to finish, I had a very good time reading it. This is certainly an enjoyable read. It'll keep the pages turning. It will keep you engaged. And it's definitely on the more easy side to fly through for sure. It's not overly complex and complicated. I loved our main character, Violet Soren Gale. She was a very strong and stubborn character. I liked following her as she was fighting her way through the writer's quadrant. I definitely liked her relationship with Zayden. As it progressed through the story, there were certainly some spicy scenes going on. And of course, I loved the dragons. The dragons were phenomenal. I will say that I do think Fourth Wing is very overhyped. I did not think that this book was special enough to be as hyped as it was, but I'm not trashing it in any way because like I said, I had a really good time reading this and I don't think that it was poorly written at all. And I think that there were some really unique aspects to the book, such as the fact that the writers are able to bond with their dragons and that there is a telepathic link between them and that the dragons are able to like channel powers through their writers. So there was a lot about this book that I enjoyed. I would say that there are two main criticisms that I have. First, kind of harkening back to what I was saying about this being an easy and simple read, I really feel like the world lacks complexity and development. I would have loved to see a lot more world building, especially regarding a lot of the history that was alluded to during the book. I would have been able to connect a lot more to the book and the world if that had been included. So I would have liked to see a lot more historical context for the world. I also would have liked a map. The only map in this book was about Best Guy at War College. There wasn't even a map of the world and I think that would have helped a lot. So the lack of depth and complexity of the world hindered my enjoyment somewhat and it also lended to it feeling a little bit more YA than new adult adult. The characters in this story are 20 years old. They're definitely adults, but just the overall way that it was written and like I said, the lack of complexity in the world lent itself to this feeling a little bit more YA at times and definitely some of the reactions of the characters and the actions of the characters felt more YA, especially like Violet's reaction to Zayden, how she couldn't keep her eyes off him and she was ogling him and he was so hot with his t-shirt off and she couldn't concentrate on her training. That was a little bit obnoxious and annoying along those same lines. As much as I enjoyed Violet and Zayden's relationship, I felt like it was a little bit all over the place in terms of development. It felt like the two spent the majority of the book ogling each other and then they went from zero to 100 instantaneously. It didn't feel like there was enough development between the two for me to be convinced that by the end that they were really in love and they were going to do everything that they could for each other. I felt like that could have explored a bit more to create a more convincing and solid relationship. So I like the two characters separately. I like the two characters together and I did root for their relationship but I would have liked to have seen more development. So basically overall more development, more development of the world, more development of the character relationships and things like that. I will say that towards the end when it was getting really intense and there was that battle that was going on, I did tear up, especially at a loss that we experienced in the book. Typically scenes that are so intense like that very, get me very, very emotional and on edge. Sarah J Mass is really, really good at doing that. And speaking of Sarah J Mass, I actually did decide to go ahead and start Kingdom of Ash, which is the seventh and final book in the Throne of Glass series. That is a chunker. It is almost a thousand pages. I am now about 140 pages into it and I'm nervous, y'all. I am. I'm very, very nervous about it because I don't know how it's going to end, but I'm here for the ride. I anticipate this book taking me a long time to read and that is okay. All right, everybody. As 
per usual, I've been rambling for a very, very long time. So I'm going to get back to editing and watching booktube and things like that. So I will check in with you again at some point, maybe not when I have a reading update because I don't anticipate a lot of reading getting done, but I will see you soon. <music> It is currently Tuesday, January 16th in the morning, and I'm sure that you can tell I am currently at home, and you're probably wondering why am I not at work? Well, Southern Mississippi is experiencing our version of extreme winter weather, and because of that, there are plenty of schools and stuff that have shut down for the day here. In the case of my institution, we are going in late at about 10 to kind of give the roads a chance to thaw. I know a lot of people are probably laughing at this right now and would love to be experiencing the extreme winter weather that we are here in South Mississippi. Mississippi, but we are just not used to this. So the city is not equipped to handle icy roads and things of that nature. So I am just here hanging out at home until I have to go into work. Of course, I'm like checking my email, doing a little bit of editing, schoolwork, and things like that. And I thought that since I actually had some time to properly update you, I would, although I really don't have any reading updates to give you because I did basically exactly what I said I would on Sunday and that I was going to spend most of Sunday and Monday when I wasn't editing or doing schoolwork, I was going to basically be trying to catch up on my booktube queue and while I did definitely watch a lot of booktube I did not catch up nearly as much as I wanted because it turns out a lot of the people that I watch were releasing very long vlogs so that's basically all that I got done yesterday was like six videos that were very long but I did start Emily Wilde's Encyclopedia of Fairies on my way to the gym yesterday because that was the one and only time that I left my house and this is actually the very final book on my official January TBR so once I've done it I'm free to read whatever I want and I already know that the remainder of the month is basically going to be filled reading all of the new releases that are coming out in January that I already have because of book of the month and things like that. So that's what I'm going to be doing as soon as I finish Emily Wilde's Encyclopedia Fairies. Like I said, I just started it. I only listened to it for about 40 minutes yesterday and then while I was getting ready today. So I don't have much to say about it. And in all honesty, I think I'm going to do a little something different this vlog. Last vlog, I was updating you as I went. So when I started the book and then maybe about midway through and then a final clip going over my full thoughts on it. And I think what I'm going to try to do with this vlog is I'm going to wait until I've actually finished the book to give you my updates. So just one clip about what the book's about and my thoughts and feelings. And that's for a couple of reasons. One, I feel like when I've just started a book like now with Emily Wilde and I try to update you, I don't really have a lot of coherent thoughts and I'm very rambly about it. And so that makes it very difficult to edit. But also I kind of forget what I've updated you about when I'm doing these in multiple different clips. So I feel like waiting until I've finished the book will make things a little bit more streamlined and cohesive and there will be a little bit less chatty and rambly updates if that makes sense. But you'll have to let me know what you prefer in these vlogs because if you prefer me to update you as I go I'm absolutely willing to do that. I'm just kind of like playing around with this. Aside from that I really don't have any updates y'all. I did take some time yesterday to read a little bit in Throne of Glass. I got about 50 pages done and I'm pretty proud of that because I don't typically read when I'm at home. There's just always something distracting me when I'm at home and it's very difficult for me to read but I wanted to read it. I wanted to make progress in it. I feel like I'm falling behind on my reading already in January and that's basically the extent of the update and I will check in with you when I have more to say or when I have finished Emily Wilde. <music> Hi 
my friends, it is actually the same day later at night. It's about nine o'clock at night. I promise I've left the spot. I went to work. I lived my whole day, but I actually did want to come on here and give you an update because I actually have one. And unfortunately it is not a good one. I think I've officially decided to DNF Emily Wilde Encyclopedia of Fairies at, I would say roughly around 35%. Audible does not give you percentages of how far you are into the book. So I'm only just guesstimating based off how much I've actually listened to. And I want to go into this and say that I really do feel like it's a me problem and not a book problem. When I went into this, I did not realize it was actually historical fantasy. I knew that a lot of people classified this as cozy fantasy and cozy just in general is not really my thing, but I typically don't always get along with historical fantasy either. So like right off the bat, that was working against it. But I do know that this book is very well loved if for no other reason than the vibes. So I know that there's just something about it that I'm missing and trust me, it kills me to make this decision, especially since I am already roughly 35% of the way in. Like I know that I had maybe only an hour of listening time and then I would have been at the halfway mark and it really kills me to DNF a book so far in especially when I know that it's a me thing not a book thing but I just don't think I can continue based on how little interest I have in the book so this follows our main character Dr. Emily Wilde and she is basically a fairy scholar she knows so much about fairies and she is compiling all of this information into a comprehensive encyclopedia and you're following her as she's traveling to this remote part of I want to say like the Netherlands as she's trying to hunt down information on a specific type of fae and so you're following those adventures and then also what happens when her colleague slash friend slash like academic nemesis Wendell Bambleby follows her there and tries to assist her and the entire book as far as I can tell because like I said I haven't gotten past the halfway mark is entirely written in journal style format because Emily is logging absolutely everything that is happening and right off the bat I felt like that lent itself to a disconnect because first of all we're only getting Emily's first person perspective again as far as I know I don't know if it changes later on in the book but also it was written kind of dryly which somewhat goes along with Emily's character and I'll get to that in a second but all of that kind of lent itself to a disinterest and I was just bored I was not paying attention every single time I had the opportunity to listen to it I didn't want to I was actively choosing booktube over listening to this and I think that's a good sign that I really should not be reading it that I should be focusing on other things and when I was still humming and hawing over whether I actually wanted to DNF this I went on Goodreads and I was actually able to find a couple of reviews that kind kind of really echo my sentiments about it and so I wanted to share them here with you. So this first one says that the book was a slog. It's not even that long but it was so boring. I felt a disconnect from the characters because of the journal format which basically made the story seem told and not shown to me and I completely agree. It felt very all tell and no show. She also goes on to say that she didn't like Emily. She says Emily was rude, judgmental, and snotty to literally everyone she meets and as far as I got in the book I didn't really have a problem with Emily's character. She kind of reminds me a little bit of Eleanor Oliphant is completely fine and that she has a problem with social convention and social cues and so it makes it really hard to like her and to connect with her but I didn't have a problem with that because I actually kind of assumed that she might be on the autism spectrum and I'm going to get to that with this next review which actually starts out with I was really close to DMFing this about halfway through and I honestly should have and so that statement right there kind of cemented my idea to DNF it because if she was halfway through and thought about DNFing it and she didn't but she wanted to I think I just need to go ahead and do it right But she said that this was pretty boring and very overwritten, and I agree with that. So it was dry and it was overwritten. She said the plot moves at a glacial pace for a book that's only 300 pages, and I completely agree. And she says that she didn't care about the main characters, but her problem was actually with a male, so Wendell Bambleby, because he was selfish, self-centered, and lazy. And I actually agree with that. Now, to the point where I got to the book, I wasn't very far into the interactions with Wendell. He'd only been there for a, a little bit, but I completely agree with what she was saying, and I didn't really find him charming or redeeming. But also, she makes a point that he pokes fun at the female main character for traits which read as marking her as clearly autistic coded. And I agree. It never occurred to me that Emily was unlikable as a character just for the sake of being unlikable as a character. I thought that there was something more underlying there, but it definitely seems like Wendell was poking fun at her and not with her. Like, I didn't feel any chemistry or connection between the two of them. Now, I'm sure that that develops later on. And that was actually the thing that I was most interested in was their relationship. And I wish that there had been more of it because I honestly had absolutely no interest in the fairy side of this whatsoever. I don't care about fairy lore. I didn't care about the fairy information. I cared about absolutely none of that. I am a character driven reader and so I wanted more of the character interactions and 35% of the way in I was not getting any of that. And so after kind of reading some of these reviews that seemed to feel very similar to me and also touching base with some people in Patreon discords that I was a part of who also felt the same, I feel kind of validated in my decision to DNF it. Now I feel really 
bad because I know that one of y'all recommended this book to me and I'm so sorry that it didn't work out. And I'm going to move on. I think I'm going to move on to the new book from Alex Michaelides because that was a book of the month selection that came to me. Either that or the newest book from Stacey Willingham. But I feel really bad that, you know, we're only about two weeks into the new year and I've already DNF'd a book, but I think I need to get a little bit more comfortable with that. DNFing a book right now feels like something is unfinished. Like I didn't follow through on a commitment is basically how I feel about that. Anyway, y'all, that was another long, super rambly update that I'm going to hate myself for later, but that is the update. I wanted to go ahead and tell you while it was a fresh on my mind because I have a feeling if I had waited until tomorrow, it was all just going to like go out of my head. So we'll see. And I'll check in with you when I actually have more of an update. <laughs> guys so it is thursday morning january 18th and i finally have another reading update for you because i decided after dnfing emily wilde's encyclopedia of fairies that i was going to start the fury by alex michaelides it was easily available to me on everand and it was something that i had selected for my book of the month subscription and i think after finishing the fury i have officially decided to break up with alex michaelides to be honest i was ready to break up with alex michaelides after the maidens but i'm doing a kind of year-long reading reading project and I needed to get the fury to satisfy the reading project and after reading it I definitely do not think that Alex Michaelides is the author for me. To quote Aoife from Pretty Purple Polka Dots, this is a book that exists and I read it. I truly don't even really know what to say about this so I'll start by saying that I actually really enjoyed the way that it was written because it's written as if the narrator Elliot is literally telling the story to you so it's written in second person it's like you are sitting in a bar across from Elliot and he is telling you the story as it happened. And basically this follows him and his experience on a Greek island with Lana, a longtime friend of his, who is a very well-known actress, but she's also very private. She's very reclusive and she just feels the need to get out of London. So she has invited Elliot along with a good friend of hers and her husband and son and a couple of other people to go to this island and somebody winds up dead. And this is Elliot recounting that experience to you and what actually happened that night. And what I really enjoyed about the way that this was written was that there is definitely a self-awareness to it because like I said, he is talking to you, the reader. So he acknowledges that he's telling a story and he acknowledges what typically happens in these stories. So you'll hear him frequently reference things like, this isn't like an Agatha Christie whodunit. Or he'll say like, these were the suspects and why they would have motive to commit the murder. And I appreciated that. But overall, the story itself just didn't do much for me. Again, because we are purely hearing this from Elliot's perspective, you don't really get a holistic view of all the other characters and what they were thinking and feeling. So there was a detachment that went along with that. And so again, none of the characters in this were particularly well developed and they weren't necessarily likable either which isn't necessarily a big deal but you don't connect to them and you don't like them so why do you even care about them right and additionally the trajectory that this book took just kind of got a little bit wild it gets hard to suspend your disbelief that all of this happened I started out thinking that this was going to be really strong just because I very much enjoyed the way the book was told and then as it went along I just started to lose more and more interest I just really could not care less about the characters and what was happening to them. Also, there was definitely nothing thrilling about this story. It's more of a mystery than anything, but it's only really a mystery because Elliot says that it's a mystery. He's like, let me tell you what happened on this island, and before I get to the whodunit, I'm gonna go in this really roundabout way of telling you the story to actually make it a story. It was a whole convoluted mess of a tale. So unfortunately, this one didn't really work for me, and it has the added consequence of kind of putting me into a little bit of a slump, because after Emily Wilde and then going into this story, which I didn't really enjoy all that much, I don't really know what I want to read next. I don't know what I feel like. I have two books for sure that I really wanted to try to get to by the end of the month. One was Stacey Willingham's newest release, Only If You're Lucky. The next one is Kate Ellis Marshall's newest release, which doesn't get released until next week, I think. So I can't even read that if I wanted to. So really the only book available to me that I wanted to read was Only If You're Lucky. But with the way that I'm feeling right now, I don't know if I want to jump into that because I feel like my mental state at the books that I've been reading recently is going to affect my enjoyment of that. I don't know. We're going to see, but I'll catch up with you when I actually know what I'm reading next.
friends. It is currently Sunday morning, January 21st. I'm about to film a video, but I thought that I would go ahead and come on here and update you for this vlog because it has been a minute. It has been a few days because I've been trying not to come on here and update until I've actually finished a book. And I think I'm deciding that I don't actually like that. I think I'm going to go ahead and switch back to the way that I was doing it before, but I have gone ahead and finished a book. It is called Close Enough to Touch by Colleen Oakley. This is actually one of her older releases. I think it was her sophomore novel published in 2017. And I absolutely absolutely adored it y'all this was such a gem and I wasn't necessarily expecting it to be I am still thinking about it I finished it last night and I'm still thinking about these characters and kind of sad that I'm not still reading the book so I think that's a sign of a really great reading experience so this is a contemporary novel that follows our main character Jubilee Jenkins and she has a very very rare allergy and it is basically an allergy to skin on skin contact so basically if she comes in contact with the skin of another person she can get hives a really bad rash she can even go into an anaphylactic shock. Basically just like anybody who has a severe allergic reaction to bees or peanuts or things like that. And the book kind of goes a little bit into the science behind this and why she would have this allergy. But basically she is allergic to human contact. She can go and she can be out in the world but she just can't physically touch anybody in it. And you can imagine the complications that has given her in her life. And essentially after a pretty embarrassing and traumatic event in high school she kind of went home and never left. You know at first it was just she didn't want to deal with the embarrassment of her condition and then it started to kind of actually morph into agoraphobia. Now she's kind of at the point where she doesn't even know if she can leave her house. She hasn't left her house in nine years and she has basically been on her own this entirety of the time because her mother actually left to go off and get married and she hasn't been back since. So Jubilee hasn't seen her mother in this time and then one day she gets a call from her mother's husband that her mother has died and so now Jubilee is having to deal with a lot. She's having to reconcile her feelings about this. She and her mom weren't necessarily close but at the same time it was still her mother and she has now been told that her mother's husband is not going to be continuing the monthly support checks that she has been sent. So she has to go out and find a way to make a living and circumstances kind of align and she is given a job at the circulation desk for the local library and her world kind of expands from there and it's about her meeting people but particularly meeting Eric and his adopted son Aja. And Eric definitely has a lot of things going on. He is a divorced father of two. He has a 14 year old teenage daughter whom he's kind of estranged from. She's not talking to him at this time and he is now living several hours away from his ex-wife and his daughter because he's temporarily taking over a leadership position at his company while somebody's on maternity leave. So he took his adopted son Aja and so he is not near his teenage daughter and he's desperately trying to connect with her. And meanwhile his adopted son also has issues of his own because Aja was originally the son of Eric's best friend and Aja's parents suddenly died in an unexpected tragic commuter plane crash and Aja has never really dealt with his grief and that's kind of manifesting itself in a really interesting way in this story and you kind of learn more about that as well. So Eric is certainly having a lot of parental issues going on and he's trying to deal with all of this and Eric comes in contact with Jubilee at the library one day and it goes from there as they start to develop a relationship especially Jubilee's relationship with Aja like I think that's what really starts it all and then she and Eric start to develop a friendship and then eventually something more and they kind of have to deal with this fact this growing attraction between them knowing that Jubilee can't be touched. I loved Jubilee and Eric so incredibly much. I just liked the development of the relationship and I kind of even liked how it ended. It was definitely a happy ending but not like a traditional happy ending. I just thought this was beautiful. I absolutely enjoyed my time reading this and I am certainly going to be reading more from Colleen Oakley. I mean that was always the plan. I have another one of her books on my physical TBR and I plan to read it this year at some point I think but this was just a gem that I wasn't expecting to pick up at this point and I really really enjoyed it and after finishing it I kind of felt a little bit more confident in picking up some of those newer releases that were waiting for me so I have also since started Only If You're Lucky by Stacey Willingham. Now I only just started it this morning while I was getting ready so I'm not crazy far into it but this is following our main character Margot I think her name is. She is a college student and it sounds like somebody in her life has died and her roommate has gone missing and they're going to be in the center of that investigation. We don't really know much about that because we're primarily spending most of our time in the past which really was only like a year ago. So I will say that I was already very nervous going into this story because it sounds like it could potentially have mean girls or toxic female friendships which I absolutely hate. I have no idea if that's the case because I'm very early days into this. So I'm going to reserve judgment. But I will say that right off the bat, this is different from the other Stacey Willingham books in that her main characters in the other books are a lot older. And that's what I was expecting from this book too. I was expecting a present perspective of our main character much older and much more removed from college. But it doesn't seem like that's the case. The present is still when she's very much in college. And so I'm not sure how I feel about that. I definitely like Stacey Willingham's more mature characters. And so I'm not sure how I feel about this all taking place like with college students in the 
college setting. I'm gonna have to give this a chance, but so far it's not starting out as strong as her other books. I'm just kind of a little bit worried about the direction that this is going to take. Anyway, y'all, again, another very long rambly update. I'm gonna go ahead and go because I have to film this video and I'm also running sprints, so I need to get a move on on this. I will check in with you when I have more updates on Only If You're Lucky by Stacey Willingham. Hi friends, it is Tuesday, January 23rd, I believe, and I'm about to head into work, but I wanted to give you an update because I have finished Only If You're Lucky by Stacey Millingham. And unfortunately, I'm so sad to say I was really disappointed by that book. Now, I went into it very trepidatiously, very cautiously, because I knew it was going to contain some of my least favorite tropes, and that is the mean girls and or toxic friendship group. But I was trusting Stacey Willingham with this because I enjoyed Flicker in the Dark, and I really, really liked All the Dangerous Things, which I read last year. It was one of my favorite thrillers of last year. And so I was thinking if anybody could make me enjoy the trope or forget about the trope in the book, it would be Stacey Willingham. But unfortunately, that was just not the case. So this follows our main character, Margot. She has just entered college. She has just ended her freshman year and she kind of wasted her freshman year. She spent her freshman year hidden away because she's still dealing with the grief over the loss of her best friend, Eliza, who died just after their high school graduation. She and her best friend were supposed to be at this college together. They were supposed to be dorm mates. It was supposed to be great. And now she is grieving that loss. And shortly before her sophomore year, she kind of gets pulled in by Lucy. Lucy is this very enigmatic, bold, magnetic, captivating kind of person. She's the one that just draws you into your orbit that you just want to be around all of the time. And Margot gets sucked in with Lucy and her two best friends, Sloane and Nicole. And Margot ends up moving into off-campus housing, kind of like right next to a frat house with Lucy and Sloane and Nicole. And things seem to be going great and everything until one of the frat brothers winds up dead. Margot has kind of realized all along that Lucy is a very secretive person. She doesn't really say a lot about herself and she knows that Lucy is hiding some things. And after that frat brother winds up dead, and by the way, he is a frat boy that Margot knew from her past who actually had a connection to her dead best friend. So there is some history there between her and this guy. She did not like this guy at all. And after he winds up dead and Lucy goes missing, Margot realizes that she's going to have to do something. She's going to have to figure out what was being hidden. Otherwise, you know, things could go badly. So first, I do want to say that I really enjoyed how the story wrapped up. All of the twists and turns started coming at the very end of the story. And I really like how Stacey Willingham wove together all of the perspectives, how she kind of tied up all the loose ends, and she made the ending very satisfying. It definitely went in a different direction than what I was expecting and so I give her props for that but unfortunately everything else about the book was kind of a loss to me. I mean first of all all of the characters are pretty much unlikable and I don't necessarily think that the characters have to be likable in order for you to enjoy the story but I do think that there has to be something about them that you root for and connect to and there just wasn't any of that and I especially didn't understand why Margot was so attracted to Lucy. We kept hearing about how amazing she was and how magnetic she was and how everybody just loved her and wanted to be near her and how she made them feel so special but I really just didn't see any of that. We were told it but we weren't shown it so I wasn't really convinced that Margot would be so drawn in by Lucy and also I have to say that hardly anything happened in the majority of the book for at least like two-thirds of this book. This was really only about Margot getting in with Lucy and her friends, drinking, partying, and all of that stuff. It was just a lot of setup. It was like Stacey Willingham was setting up all of these little things and she was inserting all these little clues and then later on in the story she would go back and explain the clues that she had dropped before. So I found the trope obnoxious. I found the characters obnoxious. I found kind of the storyline and the plot line obnoxious. I'm just really disappointed. I wasn't connected to the story. I didn't even find the story all of that interesting overall. But I do still like Stacey Willingham's writing. I find it captivating overall, but I wasn't fully engaged with the story. I wasn't fully invested in the story. And by the time we were getting to the end, I just wanted it to be over. I just was not pleased with my overall reading experience of that, unfortunately. And I'm very disappointed because I thought Stacey Willingham at this point could do no wrong, but I definitely will be reading at least one more book by her whenever she puts out a new book. I have read everything that she's published to date, and so I think I'm going to give her at least one more try just based off of my enjoyment of the other two stories. But anyway, I have since started The Vanishing Season by Dot Hutchinson, and it's actually the end to a series. It will finish the Collector series, and so far I'm honestly already invested and really enjoying it so far. Anyway, y'all, I'm going to go ahead and head into work, and I will check in with you when I have more updates on The Vanishing Season.
Hi friends, it is Thursday afternoon. I just got off work. I'm about to head to the gym. You can probably hear the rain. It is gloomy and dark outside, but I wanted to take a moment and update you because I think in the last update I mentioned that I had started The Banishing Season by Dot Hutchinson, but I don't think I said anything else and I have since finished it. This is the fourth and final book in the Collector Quartet, again by Dot Hutchinson, and it basically follows a small team of FBI agents who work on child-focused crimes. So yes, some very bad things happen to children in these stories. What makes them really captivating and gripping reads is the dynamic between the FBI agents. They are very, very close to each other. They are like family. They care greatly about each other. They've worked with each other for a long time. They've experienced some very dark things with each other. And it's just such a joy to watch their interactions. And also they don't just have that relationship with each other, but they also have that relationship with some of the victims that they've saved. So for example, the very first book is The Butterfly Garden, and you will see some of the surviving victims from that book in all of the other ones. And same with book two. Like these FBI agents become very, very close with some of these victims. And it's just so special to see. So I love the dynamic of these FBI agents with each other and as well as the dynamic that they have with some of the people that they've helped in the past. And I think that they've definitely gotten better as they go along for the most part. Book number one is definitely my least favorite. I really loved two. Two was my favorite up until I got to this fourth and final book. It is easily my favorite. And not only was this just a solid ending to this series, but it was just such an amazing and solid thriller slash crime book. You know, I typically don't get emotionally attached in these stories because they're very much all plot and vibes and not necessarily about character development or growth or things of that nature. And so even though thrillers are my favorite genre, they don't necessarily get five stars for me because there's always a lack of emotional attachment. But there were about three different instances near the end of the story where I was tearing up because of what happened in the book. And I just think it takes a special type of book in this genre for that to happen. It usually does not happen. So I rated this a 4.5 stars and I highly recommend this series. I don't really want to say too much of what this specific book was about just because there is a personal connection to one of the FBI agents and it's one that you learn more about in each of the other books and so I don't really want to say too much about it but all I'll say is that it starts with a young eight-year-old girl going missing. She has been kidnapped and her kidnapping ends up being tied to a string of missing girls that have gone missing over the past like 30 years. That's all I'm going to say about it but I think if you can really handle the subject matter of these stories they're very much worth the read but I just thought that they were well done and I really enjoyed them for the most part. I don't know if Dot Hutchinson has written anything else since she finished this series. I don't think that she has but I will certainly be on the lookout for more in the future. In terms of what I'm reading next is The X by Ella Fairburk. I definitely want to read more from Ella Fairburk to decide if I want to continue with her as an author. I read another book by her. I don't think it was last year. I think it was in 2022 that I read my first book by her and I really enjoyed it. It was one of those books that was really bingeable but it didn't really have lasting power because I I can't tell you anything about it. So I'm kind of concerned that maybe all of her books are going to be that way. And I don't know if I want to invest time in that. So I'm going to go ahead and start the X and see what I think, see if I want to continue with it. And once I've actually started it and have some thoughts, I will let you know. Off to the gym I go in this lovely weather and I will check in with you when I've actually started the X. <laughs> friends. It is currently Saturday, January 27th, and I'm in the middle of hosting all day sprints, but I wanted to take a moment and pop on here and officially close out the vlog. I did end up starting and finishing The X by Ella Fair Burke, and I really enjoyed it, but similarly to my last experience with Ella Fair Burke, I don't think her books have lasting capacity. I always enjoy her writing style. I think that she crafts very clever stories. They're very engaging. They're compulsively readable. You just want to keep turning the pages and finding out what's happening, but at the end of the day, they're all plot and no character development and they're very fast paced like I said and so after I've had some distance from the story I'm not going to be able to remember much if anything about it and I don't think I'm going to be continuing with Ella Fairburk in the future. But just to give you an idea this followed our main character Olivia. She is a defense attorney in New York City and basically she gets called by a teenage girl who she doesn't know but she knows of because this teenage girl is actually the daughter of her ex-fiance. She and this fiance broke up 20 years prior 
she ended up cheating on this man, kind of like ruined his whole life. And now he has been arrested for the murder of three people at a local football field because he actually has a personal connection to one of the victims and that one of the victims was actually the father of a boy that went on a shooting spree at Penn Station killing his wife. And so they think that basically he shot this man in vengeance because he was not a great man. He was not a good father. And a lot of people blame this man for what his son ultimately ended up doing. And his daughter knew of his past relationship with Olivia. And so basically she calls Olivia and says, hey, you owe my dad. You need to help him. So this is about her trying to defend Jack while also simultaneously trying to find out what happens because at first she is staunchly convinced of his innocence. But then as time goes on, she is questioning his innocence. And so you as the reader, you have no idea whether he's guilty or innocent. And you're kind of following that same path with Olivia who doesn't know if he's guilty or innocent, but still she's his defense attorney and she has to do everything that she possibly can to get him out of prison. There's definitely some legal aspects to this, which I always enjoy when they're done well in a story. And like I said, ultimately it was a very positive reading experience from start to finish. It was kind of exactly what I needed because I didn't necessarily go into it with super high expectations. I didn't expect it to blow my mind or anything like that, but I do think that it was well crafted and I do think that it's worth the read. It's just not something that's going to stick with me. So yes, 3.5 stars. Not mad that I read it at all. It's just not anything amazing. And then after I finished the X, I had a really hard time figuring out what I wanted to do. Absolutely nothing sounded good. I couldn't pick anything that night to start reading. And I did the same this morning. I went through almost half the day without picking up something to read. But then I filmed my February TBR video and I went ahead and decided to pick up early one of my February reads called Autobiography of a Face. Out of the challenge pools, this was the one and only book that was an actual recommendation by y'all. This is definitely something that I'd never heard of. And I certainly don't read nonfiction. I don't read memoirs and I especially don't read memoirs about people that I don't know or have an investment in. So this is definitely something that I'm not really interested in. Also, the sun is doing the most right now, y'all. So the lighting is like keeps changing drastically in this video and I'm sorry about that, but at least it's natural lighting. So basically I decided to start Autobiography of a Face. It is very, very short. It's only about three hours of listening time. So I will be finishing it this weekend and just getting it out of the way. And I'm really hoping that I enjoy it more than I think that I'm going to. And I really hope that once I'm done listening to it, I'm in a more clear headed mind on what to pick up next. I'm probably just going to continue with my February TBR going forward because there's only a few days until February and I've finished my January TBR a long, long time ago. Anyway, that's going to do it for this video, y'all. I hope that you like it. I hope that you continue to enjoy these bi-weekly reading vlogs. As always, if you like this video or if you just like me, please be sure to give it a big thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. I typically post two videos a week on Wednesdays and Sundays and I would love to connect with you in any of those videos or on any of my other social media platforms, which I always leave linked down below, along with the books that I may talk about in these vlogs. Until the next vlog, y'all. Bye.